Jin, Lakesh, and Veritas, everyone, sending you the frequencies of oneness and truth. You are now tuned into The Other Sun, Suncast, weekly podcast, bringing you elevated topics focused on expanding ourselves and humanity into becoming truth and moving into oneness. And we're coming all the way live from one mind. I am Tavares of the Sun, Quantum Light Property Clearing Instructor. We have with us today Laota of the Sun, the architect of Of the Sun and Jessica of the Sun, an ally and advocate for Of the Sun. So in Lakesh and Veritas. In Lakesh and Veritas. In Lakesh and Veritas. Welcome, welcome. So this week's topic, we will be identifying common incongruencies that stretch across the human experience. Incongruencies within our relationships, our health, our career, finances, even our spiritual exploration and journey. So I'm going to pass it over to Jessica, because I know this was your, your topic here and you were fiery for it. So would you like to kick us off with any ideas or concepts regarding the idea of incongruencies? Yes, absolutely. So that, that, that's been coming up a lot lately. And I think that was a media topic that was touched on is there was, there was a, the Miami Herald, I believe it was the Miami Herald that had the front page of the newspaper said two conflicting uh, things about like one was bars are closing. The other one was schools are reopening during the COVID situation. And we had touched on that a little bit about what we were seeing in the media and what was going on, you know, in the exterior lately. And I think that's, I think we're kind of living in an environment of that right now. Am I, am I correct in saying that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That there's a lot of that in our, that's surrounding us right now. So I think I've personally, I've experienced many people lately having these incongruent thoughts, like I'm going to do this. No, I'm going to do that. And it's, it's almost like they're pulling and it's a, it's a tug of war back and forth to decide what to do. And the problem with that is you're not reaching a, conclusion which i from my experience leads to like a looped pattern does that that's, sound <laughs> that's absolutely the case the chaos the confusion the consternation is very real in our experience we are in the moment of a spiral a death spiral of uh, civilization we are deconstructing this is the time of the reset. The kind of confusion with the fact that what used to be is no more. People have not yet adjusted to what can be and what will be the future because they haven't yet seen it and they have no history with it. And then the same idea of us constantly being in loop patterns from our greater or previous existence. <clears throat> so I think a, a there's so many ways to look at it, but I think we should start with the law. The law is you get what you call for. If you call for two diametrically opposed ideas, then you will get nowhere, or you'll get the one that is the strongest of the two. And if you don't decide, the universe will no longer wait for you to decide. So the law is, is that if you ask for something, if you practice something, if you affirm something, if you're in a looped pattern for something, your outcomes will reflect in direct proportion and clarity whatever you're asking for. That is the law in this universe, that all things follow that law. So when we find, like for instance, a situation where many of us have patterns of appeasement, where we will do what someone else wants us to do, even when we don't want to do it. So those are two diametrically opposed ideas. And our the, or, the, the <clears throat> conscious organism that is our body is now pulled in two different directions. So this would mean that the body and the mind, the body is going to the movies because someone asked us, and the mind is saying, I don't want to go. I want to stay home and wash my hair. And so now the body is being pulled apart quite literally, which would be a dis-ease or disease. And then this uh, dynamic of 
a repeated pattern of always doing something you don't want to do is an incongruency, which is we see in our greater landscape of our world, we see the World Health Organization or the CDC or the, and then the government are not congruent. So there's this pulling apart of what the outcome will be. So we can't get a congruent outcome. And if you sit in the movie theater, watching the movie you didn't want to go see, eating the popcorn, thinking you would rather be washing your hair, it's the same incongruency. The principle remains, the law remains the same. So you get what you call for. So if you do that, you end up sick or you end up in a, a uncomfortable situation depending on the intensity, regularity, and how looped your pattern is. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. And as you were saying that, um, I have stories. <laughs> uh, appeasement was a self, uh, was a past life negative motivator that I personally carried and that I had to work through. So the, the example definitely resonated. So I'd like to give a, a practical example from my past that speaks to this type of tearing on the inside when the mind is in one place, but we do an action that's in the complete opposite direction. And uh, this dealt with a business relationship. And uh, again, I was heavy in the appeasement at this point in time. And this individual wanted me to do something and me and my appeasement, I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I could feel everything within my being and my body and my cells saying, no, don't do it. This is not what you want. And as I walked away from the interaction, walked outside the building, every step that I took, uh, uh, as I agreed upon the incongruent, uh, upon this idea, I can feel my, my insides on fire. I could feel the anger. I could, I was just completely in balance. And I made it down the block, turned around, and I had to tell this person, no, I can't, I'm sorry, I cannot do this. And the moment I said that, I could feel the congruency, the alignment, I could feel the anger and the fire or the, that dis-ease that I was putting myself in completely disperse. And it, it was a major lesson of congruency. And, and really, if, if you don't want to do something, don't do it. You know, if you want to do something, do it. And how when we are incongruent with ourselves and we're not being truthful, uh, it is pain and suffering ultimately. And it really doesn't serve anyone because in that situation, uh, I wasn't being truthful to the person. I wasn't being truthful to myself. So all parties lose, you know, so it, it was definitely a learning experience. And, uh, you know, and even today I continue to chip away at it, you know, because that experience was so profound for me. So that was something that came up when you were speaking of, going in two different directions and what's taking place in the body. And this is so true, this idea of what comes up inside of you, your body, the biology itself says, no, you're thinking one thought, you're making my body go in a different direction. It would be the same thing in our greater sense if you hate the person you vote for. You know, that's an incongruency. I'm gonna vote for you, but I hate you. <laughs> you know, so what can we, <laughs> what can we get from that experience? Appeasement is not the truth. It is, though, what we are taught. We are constantly being told, you do this anyway, even if you don't like it. You know, like, you know, bite the bullet and do it anyway against your own will, against your own inner thoughts. And, but that's not the truth. You cannot get to the truth from something that is not the truth. You, if you start off wrong, you end up wrong. If you start off in appeasement, when you get to, when you go from one to 10 and then 10 to 100, you're in the wrong place. By the time you get to 100, you're really at 102 or at 98, you're not at 100. So you cannot get to the truth by starting off in appeasement. You can only get illness and um, mental illness, physical illness, spiritual illness from that understanding. So I think that's an excellent idea. All of us have been taught to be in appeasement instead of finding the truth that we can align with, because it doesn't have to be that you cannot align yourself with it. You can say, no, I don't wanna go. 
And then you can think about, would it be in my best interest to go? And then you can put yourself in harmony and say, I think I do want to go now. And now all of my bits and pieces are lined up. We're all thinking the same thing. And when I move my foot forward, my mind, my body, my spirit, my luminous feel, my etheric body, all are in accord. So I have put myself in harmony with that. But did you put yourself in harmony with it because you truly want it? Or did you do it? The appeasement is, did you do it because you didn't see the right in it? You saw that someone else wanted you to do it. So there is like a slippery slope there where you don't want to trick yourself into doing things you don't want to do. At the same time, you have the power to harmonize with whatever you do. So sometimes when people are comfortably without money, they find a way to be happy with what they have. They harmonize, they align themselves with the truth of their experience. It doesn't mean they're appeasing the, that they don't have something, but that they can still have joy and happiness in whatever condition they're in. That would be a way of expressing how you harmonize yourself instead of like, I hate my life, I hate my life, I don't have any money, I hate this. And, you know, and spending all of that negative energy to disrupt yourself, rather you say, well, I can um, be in this moment until I'm in the next. I'll be thinking the thoughts that will propel me into what I want. So I can be in harmony in the moment I'm in as I prepare for my next moment of expansion. Does that make sense? Makes that totally sense. makes sense. Yeah. And, and you're, and you're right in saying that that's kind of like a social grace yes. is, and I can say grow. So growing up in the, in the South with, a bunch of Yankee Northerners <laughs> was an incongruency in and of itself, right? Because you, you've got that culture that's very demanding and in your face on the home front. And then the people surrounding me, the, the appeasement thing was huge in the South. And one of my dear friends actually called that out in me. She said, I think you get that from being growing up in the South because it's, you're taught that it's a social grace to say yes, even if you mean no. And so you actually, you get to the point where you don't even notice that you're doing it. You just do it because you think by saying no, you're doing something wrong or you're hurting someone. So, I mean, appeasement is, the intention is kind, you know, it, it's not like it's coming from malintent, but uh, it's just diametrically opposed, like you said. <laughs> it's so interesting that you say that because so much of our lives are upside down and sideways in that way. If we identify the law though, that will help us find the way. So the solution to this is know that the law is you get what you call for. If you call for confusion and um, things to be not clear and not the way you want them to be, if your actions are calling for it, it's not just that you sit somewhere and you say, I want this, but do your actions show that you want it? You know, it's, I, I always like to give the example of uh, love should look and feel like love. So if someone is yelling at you, that doesn't feel like love. If someone is controlling you, that doesn't feel like love. So all of these labels, you say, well, they love me. That's why they're doing that. That's not true. <laughs> that, that's another incongruency. That's controlling, looks and feels like controlling. And so its name should be control. Love looks and feels different than that. And its name should then be love. So when you confuse the two, you have an incongruency. But if you go to the law that you get what you call, whatever it is your actions and your thoughts and your words are saying is what the universe will show you. That's what you will, will, what you will receive if you are a student in, of the sun and you have practices that you repeat and things that you affirm, uh, then you can break the loop patterns if you're enthusiastic enough to come against the gravity, you know, the, the sheer gravity of the loop pattern that holds you in it. So of course you have the power to break it if you're enthusiastic enough to break the pattern. Because the pattern's not only your pattern, it's your mother's pattern or her mother's pattern. But in point of fact, the truth is <clears throat> you always get exactly what you call for, whether you're calling it for it in your actions or in your thoughts or in your dreams or in your secret compartments, you still get what you call for. 
And if you can't see it, often you can't see it. So I have, when I spoke yesterday about uh, you did a property clearing and you saw mold and you found something interesting about the mold. Do you remember that conversation? Jessica. Oh yes, I'm here. <laughs> I do, of course. Yes, I, I was. I was. Try, I was not sure if you were talking to him or you were talking to me. <laughs> um, yes, I actually do. Yeah. And so, what were the people calling for who had mole? What was it that you found when you looked, or did you? Do you remember? Because there's so many things. Yeah, there was a lot of things. Um, it was mostly. Um, like they were thinking different things, but they weren't communicating with each other about them. Like one person had one idea and the other person had the other, a different idea. And so when, when we see the mole out in the open, we can see that the darkness of the mole shows us the poison of them not being congruent. Exactly. Yeah. And I actually have an interesting question that I'm sure will, has come up in a lot of people's minds. And that's, when you find yourself having been in that pattern for a while, how do you, and you, and you, and you recognize it and you come to the point where you're like, Oh, I've been in this incongruency pattern. How do you come out of that? And you have to match the energy. Uh, so if okay. You have an unconscious energy of always saying yes. You have to match that with a conscious energy of saying what you really think. If you know oh, your yes okay. is automatic, then you have to be present and in the moment and pay attention and examine your experience. And when every time someone says something, you have to say, you have to check, do I feel like I want this? Or am I just saying yes, because I've been programmed and I've been developed in that way by my upbringing. I'd like to ride that piggy, piggyback on that idea and, uh, what she's saying about observing your reality, monitoring yourself, you know, for someone who's an appeaser, you already know what it looks like. And a great place to start is the people who are close in, the things that you usually fall into appeasement with, the situations and circumstances that you uh, have agreed to and or you find yourself at the end of it, dang, why did I agree to that? Why did I say yes? you know, <laughs> feeling the regret or the remorse or punishing yourself, you know, looking at those scenarios that are in our everyday experiences that we encounter with those who are around us and, and then starting from there. And as Lao Tzu said, uh, catching yourself and choosing to do the opposite, you know, but with the conscious intention. And uh, one thing that, that I've personally done that has been successful for me and that I've uh, recommended to other clients is call it forth at the beginning of your day set the tone and with your guidance and say, Hey, you know, I want to see this appeasement, show me the areas of appeasement. And uh, we have different tools that you can utilize, like calling for the highest possible vibration. When you're confronted with an experience that is rooted within the frequency of appeasement so that you can bring yourself to the appropriate pitch and level where we can transmute it and choose something different, which is something that would be in alignment. That's so um, on point because when you call for the highest possible vibration, you're really calling for an algorithm that disrupts fear. It's an algorithm in the universe that um, pulls apart things that you're afraid of. And when that takes place, you're no longer in the fear that someone else's feelings will be hurt or that somehow you're in charge of the entire universe and that if you don't say yes, all things will you know, discontinue, the world, world will stop revolving because there is this um, overreaction to our own experience with others. When, if we, when we're raising children, we can see that if we tell them the truth, they'll put themselves in harmony with it. And they'll be like, oh, we're not going to the park. We're gonna go play outside, okay. I wanted to go to the park, but I'm good with playing outside, you know? So it's really that simple. Often you're surprised when you do, and I think you may have something on this, Tavares, when you do actually confront the fear of saying no, or that you don't want to do that, or it's not the right time, or it's inappropriate for you, or, you know, why'd you even ask me that? <laughs> you know, like, 
you know, what, what's up with that? You know, when you do that, the person immediately falls back because mm -hmm. you have made them bigger than they are in your own mind and feel that you're compelled to be in agreement with something you're not in agreement with. But you have the free choice to choose whatever you would like. And when people know that you'll always say yes, then it becomes more, the requests become more egregious. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's definitely true. I'd like to bring back the experience that I shared uh, with the business slash relationship. And when I went back in to share with the person, look, I cannot do this. This is incongruent to me. They, as Lao Tzu mentioned, immediately fell back. They said, okay, well, it's cool. And I was just in shock and awe, astonished. It was that easy? I could have just said no all this time. But I was, again, I was running off of this program that the appeasement was so deeply ingrained to where uh, when experiences like that would come up, all the past memories would surge to the forefront of my consciousness of when I would have to do things beyond my will for my mother or family members or uh, old lovers and expecting the same outcome, you know, but again, it's, it's often easier than what it appears to be. And it was a really great example for me and lesson to show me how usually it's just the old memory. You know, it's, it's just something that's not even present right now. And we're just projecting Absolutely. on it in the current time, giving it more energy or power than, uh, is necessary. Well, so it's important to know that science teaches us, and it is true, that when we look at a picture or bring up a thought, within 17 seconds, our brain is gathering all of the like circumstances. So every time you're in an appeasement situation that's uncomfortable and you think about it, then all of the factors flood in into your brain because that's how the brain works. It gathers like material and it shows you all of the scenarios many of which didn't end the way you wanted them to end. And then that challenges you and creates anxiety and fear. And you feel like, oh, I, if I do this, something terrible will happen. But in truth, if you stand up in truth, the truth will support you as the truth does not require anything else but itself. I don't want to do that. That's strong enough. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's like in the story. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's like that. There is um, such a, there's so many areas in which we have been compromised through yeah. our uh, upbringing and our cultural understandings. And one I'd like to bring forward is often uh, people have partners who, male or female, and the partner is very comfortable with you being your smallest self you being your weakest self, you being your most broke self, you being your most unemployed self. And when you have partners in these situations, uh, we at, at some level, and we're all psychic, we know that they're very comfortable with us being weak and them being great. And so this, if you were to be greater, it might disrupt the apple cart. It might mean that it would be too much for them because they're, they met you in a moment of weakness and you're, they're very comfortable with you in that weakness. If you were to grow stronger, then you might lose the relationship. That's a real thing. So that happens with men and women. And so the, as you want more, at the same time that you want more and want to step into all of your potentials, you have committed yourself to the limitation and the liability of being limited for them so that they can be comfortable. This is something that everyone has done, but women, mothers, wives, partners, lovers do it all the time because the limitation of whoever you have presented yourself to be, even though you continue to grow, has become so comfortable that now you find yourself in a painful incongruency that cannot be resolved until you choose you instead of them till you remove them from the altar at which you have placed them and um, then choose yourself and then see what happens. This is a, a very important thing because your weakness does not make another stronger, although it is the delusion that, or the illusion 
that your choice to be weak makes someone else feel stronger. And so this is a very important thing. Most of our mothers, most of our grandmothers, most of women in general and men as well are constantly being um, confronted with this reality that you might be great and have the potential and have all of the trajectories for greatness. But if you do, you know that it would hurt the feelings of your mother, brother, sister, father, lover. And so you choose, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I've been taught to be a good little person. If I do this, they'll be confused because I'll be great. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, I won't be as little as they're comfortable with me being with. I won't be as broke. I won't be as unemployed. I won't be as weak and helpless as makes them feel strong and powerful. So there is that. Yeah. There's so many experiences that are flooding into my consciousness now. Uh, I'll specifically speak on one that relates to family and this, this concept of appeasing family and making yourself small. And uh, around the time of the early years of property clearing, I, I was living with family and I was uh, assisting in a major way financially. And I knew that I was destined for more. Fast forward to where I am now, clearly. <laughs> but looking back in that experience, while I was in that experience, I could see how uh, there was a big fear of moving away from my family and pursuing something different. You know, because there, there's a lot of people, and my, my family is one of them, where you stay in this, you grow up in the same town, live in the same house, you know, you never really expand yourself out. And, uh, for me personally, I needed to get out and, and grow and pursue this life of property clearing and save myself and help others save themselves. And when I confronted my family saying that I would be leaving, ah, there we go with the, oh, don't leave, why are you leaving? There's the guilt and I could feel the, the appeasement uh, or the, the urge to appease them, you know, based on their desires, which equated to, okay, let's make yourself let's make ourselves small tea, you know, but so this, this is something that I know many people go through and however the narrative is set up it, in terms of relationships, there's always this, this pull and this tug of war uh, internally where we know the truth, but because of some old program or because of other uh, resonant frequencies like guilt and appeasement and self punishment or even doubt, we make ourselves small or we stay within the same situation. No, we sabotage ourselves. We, That's it. And, and this sabotage program really um, handicaps and retards everyone else's development. So when you feel that when you uh, choose to be weak, then the other person does not have an opportunity to be challenged to grow, mm -hmm. to grow and meet you. You know, when, uh, a, when in nature, when it's time for a bird to fly, they get pushed out of the nest. Then they're challenged to fly. If you continue to feed them and bring food to the nest, they stay in the nest and wait for you. Yes, certainly. <laughs> and that's what your situation was, yeah. you know. Literally. It, yeah, it was literally. literally. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and I like to say, moving forward, uh, it served both me and my family, you know, uh, living in the house with my grandmother and my mother, they were able to manage. You know, they got whatever lessons that they needed to grow. But again, I would have deprived them and myself, you know, from the growth experience through me choosing to be congruent. You know, so it's, it's, it's just fascinating how, again, when we move into congruency and alignment, it serves everyone. It's uh, what we do for us, we do for all. You know, it's a major thing. And it, it also moves into one of the solutions is co-sponsibility. Uh, Ho'oponopono has grown up to be responsible, a responsible adult. <laughs> it's now co-sponsibility. <laughs> and it now knows that its elevation is based on taking responsibility for itself and that it is back to the example I often use about being on the airplane, that you must take your oxygen first. Otherwise, everyone will remain the same. And we don't know what brilliant things are in another until we first bring out the brilliant things in ourselves. And there is a need for you to choose you. 
it is a need for you not to elevate others desire to keep you limited above your need to be the potential of what you were born to be. There's a real principle here that when we don't do it, we go against the law. Mm. We go against the law of evolution. We go against the law of you're supposed to be greater. Each generation successively should be more, greater, have um, be able to pull everyone else forward through your own uh, movement. So I think the another key would be being in whole responsibility. Call, repeat often, thank you, I love you, please forgive me, I'm sorry, to help break the loop patterns, to help move the interference patterns, to help you see the truth of how you were, you were nose blind, so to say, to how we were brought up, how our religious indoctrination and our cultural indoctrinations have made us suppress our ability to be who we are. And this, the universe will no longer wait for us to decide to step into ourselves. The ones who step into their cells will be elevated. The ones who don't will have the opportunity to see how that works out for them. <laughs> so Jeff? if uh, I just have one uh, quick question. So if somebody has found themselves in that pattern for, for some time, maybe like a month or something, and they want to like come out of it, is there a way to undo what has been done in that in that month with a way of thinking? Uh, can you reverse that or can you switch that around? I'm sure a yeah. lot of people would have that question. <laughs> yeah, so you are the divine element in your universe. You have the will, if you have the will to do it. You may need to get in a salt bath every night of the week and call for clarity to call forth your own potential, to empower yourself to move forward in your own behalf. And know that if you do not, no one else will. No one else will uh, be the victor or the hero in your hero story. You must be your own hero and your willingness and enthusiasm to get to it will determine how fast it happens. It could happen today or it could happen in six months, depending on how enthusiastically you embrace the concept of stepping into your own potential. And this is something that everyone should really, really know. Um, you tie yourself inextricably to limitation by continuing to be limited. You tie yourself forever at the tightest knot that cannot be tied as you continue and it becomes worse once you become aware of it. Once you know that you have the opportunity, you see the pattern, you know you're doing it, then your awareness punishes you if you don't do it. Not the universe, you being aware that you're not being yourself and that you've been given yourself and you've decided to squash it so that someone else can be stronger than you then the pain is greater. If you're unaware, it's painful. If you're aware, it's more painful. And yes, you can stop your own pain immediately by enthusiastically embracing you to be the divine creation and step into the potential that's available to you for all levels of greatness. There is not any um, benefit in making yourself less than you are. That is incongruent. That is against the law. You can call for smallness in your bigness. <laughs> that makes sense. What, what, you will get, <laughs> what you will get is a, um, uh, what we see, chaos, confusion, consternation. You can't keep calling to be small so someone else will be comfortable while you're a giant and then expect to have a giant experience it's an incorrect scrambled algorithm there yeah or absolutely equation. absolutely in and it, it relates to everything it relates to the food we eat you can't eat death and think you're going to get life you can't constantly eat things that are dead thinking oh this dead thing will make me a lot will make me life this is a completely diametrically opposed uh, incongruency that our world is steeped in. 
I'll just eat all this, you know, this big porterhouse steak and that'll keep me alive. What that does, is, <laughs> <laughs> it's dead. It, it's dead and not animated anymore and that it will give me life. But if you eat, you know, sprouts, sprouts are life and they give you life because it is life. And it makes sense to fill yourself up with life if you're interested in living. But you can take the slow path out. You can eat things that will sustain you for a short period of time until they don't. Or you can eat life and continue to be life always, even in death, it is important to have been life. You know, often we're eating food that has so many preservatives that we're preserved all the way up to our neck until we die. It's like, oh, preserved all the way up to the neck. All right, lay down. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. The, the, the incongruency I hear often around food is people talking about how they're trying to lose weight and they'll go on like a, a crash diet or something or they'll eat like processed cookies or some of that processed food and it's like no you have to do an entire lifestyle change and eat healthy you know lively food like fresh vegetables and things like that i would always encourage people to look at the human design the design of humans is slender beings and even though culturally some people are not you know there are different cultures that have different body types and we do need to look at our lineage we can see how we are not in alignment with who we are by what we look like even if it's it's not necessarily like you don't have big breasts or big hips there are variations but in general people are designed to be slim and often what we see on people are thought forms we see their thought forms of fear or we see their thought forms of greed and it look it's literal <clears throat> it's quite literal and then they think that well if i don't eat and it often doesn't work they're still big and they can't figure out well you're still you're still in the frequency of the fear or the greed or the hoarding or any of the things that quite literally show up on the body you know, the, it's like, um, you know, the model of Texas is, you know, everything is bigger. So, you know, you want to be bigger, you want bigger hair, you want bigger bodies, you want bigger breasts, you want bigger butts. And so that's what the bodies look like, because that's what you're calling for. So then you're also calling to eat the food that produces that. But if you eat things that are alive, they cannot produce that. There's no amount of sprouts that you can eat that would make that. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny <laughs> and true <laughs> and congruent <laughs> and it's congruent so it's also the thoughts about food that have to do with what the person's body looks like what they relate to and the other thought forms that they actually carry that are visible around their body as weight these are the things they carry, you know, and you can kind of see it. Um, I travel light. I travel with just a overnight bag mostly, or when I move, I move with very little and it's suitable and in alignment with what I look like because I travel light. So That's funny, we, I do too. Yeah. So you should, you know, we should think about it that we are the literal interpretation of our thoughts. It is my literal thought to travel light. So I, and I've been thinking it for decades. So I travel light. It's interesting. I'm, I'm seeing how there's this law playing out of correspondence where uh, the general idea is that we are light, light beings, and, you know, to keep our thoughts light and, uh, even at the, the physical level, the bio, biology uh, is designed to look relatively light, you know, and then everything we do in terms of our actions, behavior, and the example you gave of uh, the things we carry in our travel, keeping it light, you know, so, and to, to again, stay in congruency and alignment with uh, the essence of who we are is what I'm getting, at least from that example. And then the, the ideas of, that are the opposite of that, hoarding, greed, 
uh, over indulgence. These are all the opposite of this idea of a light being or lightness or light, which all that word in all of its interpretations is, is appropriate. So it's, it's an interesting thought, but these are some of the ideas of incongruencies that are permeate our experience that we are just not, you know, like you said, uh, Jessica, people are saying, well, I'm going to fast for three days and that will wipe out 30 years of me being greedy. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, that one. <laughs> or I'm going to fast for three days and uh, it'll make my house where I'm hoarding things go, it'll make that go away. But you, you, you're, you take yourself with you everywhere you go. So if you're hoarding, you take the hoarding energy with you everywhere you go. If you're, whatever the situation is, if you're not feeling secure and you feel like you need security around you, you take that with you everywhere you go and uh, fasting for three days doesn't make that go away. So this is where the work comes in at Of The Sun, where we can identify these things, isolate them, and start to um, disrupt the gravity of the loop patterns. So that, yes, Jessica, you could be free of this today if you can get to it like that within yourself. Each person can get to it like that within them. They can be free of it. It's the same way with people who want to spend a lot of money and they spend a lot of money, but then they begrudge spending a lot of money, you know? So then they're always having money issues, no matter how much money they have, because they're constantly in subtraction because there's no free flow of energy. Money is just energy. If I don't want to pay you and I don't want to pay for this and I don't want to do this and then you have the money, then you put a blockage in your flow of money. Or if you think, well, I don't want to spend money. I only want to keep money. That's a blockage in how you think about money. Money is energy that is in flow. It's kind of like uh, the biblical story of the guy with the three talons. You know, he buried them and kept it out of flow. And then the other person won. In the end, the person who had done something with the energy and made more energy from it then became the person who was um, honored. Not the one who, through fear, buried the talents. So this idea of money, it works the same way weight works. It works the same way of, you know, whatever altar you're praying at. If you're like, oh, you're so wonderful. I'm going to stay small so you can be wonderful. Or if it's uh, I'm going to eat steak and then pray to be skinny. Or if it's, you know, I'm going to, you know, eat all the donuts and bear claws and, you know, hope to look like um, humans are supposed to look when it's unlikely that will happen. So these, all of these incongruencies, we all face, and I have been through all of them. I've been through, you know, the idea of making someone bigger than me so I could make myself smaller so that they would be comfortable and they wouldn't be challenged to have to be greater because it would be so uncomfortable for them if I were great. So, um, you know, I'm not doing that anymore. I have been heavy <laughs> and realized that you can't eat bread and potatoes all day and be little. <laughs> I have experienced that as well. <laughs> so, you know, all of these things uh, are real life experiences that we have all had. And um, it is a symptom of what's happening in our larger world with the incongruencies of what uh, scientists are saying and what uh, the facts show us in our own experience and then what we're being told to do. These are all right in our faces. But the law is you get what you call for. If you call for five different things that are not harmonized, you will get confusion and chaos, and consternation, which is the world that we're currently living in. But it does not have to be your reality. It could easily, you could easily make your world one of harmony and not experience the pain and suffering that being outside of the law of the universe produces for us. So, so much of this we are blind to. Like you said, Jessica, Growing up in a certain locale with certain kinds of thoughts and certain kinds of ideology, 
makes us nose blind to our behavior, but our, our lives are worthy of investigation. Our lives are worthy of our paying attention. What Tavares said about deciding every morning, okay, I'm gonna pay attention so I can correct this. And then, you know, doing the things that are in opposition to that. Be an advocate for self. Decide that you can, you will open the door to your potential. Do the things that you're resisting doing because you don't want to rock the boat. Hmm. Rock the boat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. This is again, uh, I think, another excellent podcast where uh, we gave so many different practical examples from uh, myself, Lao Tzu, Jessica, and then on top of that, real practical solutions that people can apply real time within their experiences. We can also see that even if we're in a circumstance of incongruency, we have the power to correct it. We can choose to move ourselves into alignment. So uh, before we wrap up, any final thoughts before we go? I wish I had the uh, music to rock the boat. (laughs) I think I might uh, add that in there now (laughs) on the edit. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, that's a a good idea. Yeah, we'll do that. Are you talking about that song? I rock the boat. 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 (laughs) Yeah. All right, for uh, our listeners on the YouTube, comment, chime into this conversation. What were some of your incongruencies? What were some of your victories of transmuting it? How did you overcome it? Uh, Also, uh, for some of the other sunners using these practices, how have these worked for you? Let's uh, start that convo in the chat box. Also, for anyone listening, make sure you click on that subscribe button. Click on that little bell, ding, so you can get our notifications. We're releasing a podcast every single week with conscious, expansive, elevating topics to move us again more into oneness and truth. So before we go, just a gentle reminder, let us all call for the frequency of truth and let us see the truth in everything. Let us hear the truth and let us be the truth in all things. In Lakesh and Veritas. In Lakesh and Veritas. Never give up. Always know that there is a future. Never give up. I love that. In Lakesh and Veritas. I can't end it any better than what you just did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>